Hey guys, thanks so much for joining me today to look at a man and his path. This is going to be our second study in our um, series that we started last week at Man Church that JMO did. So if you missed that, if you weren't able to be here or catch it online, you can always go back to this site and look at that and fill in your blanks that you need to. But for this week, like I said, we are on a man in his path, and we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. So if you have a Bible, turn it on, grab it, open it up, and get there. So when we're ready, you'll be ready. We want to hopefully pull out some principles and some nuggets from God's Word in order to apply to our lives to today to see what God really has for us to say to us about our path. And here's the truth. All of us are heading somewhere. The difference is some of us know where we're going and how we're going to get there. But I would guess that just as many, if not more of us, would say, I don't have a desired destination or at least a plan to get where I'm going. And so what does your path look like? Where are you headed? Are you going to end up where you want to be? One thing is certain. Our direction will ultimately determine our destination. And hopefully today will better help us define what that should look like for each of us. I hope you also have your handy outline that you could pick up here at the church. If you don't already have one of these, they are available here at the church. And um, for $10, you can pick one up so you can fill in the blanks on that. And then not just for yourself, but so you can go back through this with some other guys and talk it out and gain some perspective also from their point of view. But before we get to that, I want to pray for us and then read this passage together. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you that you're with us, that you're present in our lives, God, that you have the power to change us and make us more like you. And God, we thank you for everything you're going to accomplish, not only through this time that we're having together today, but the entire study series that we're going to do. God, we ask you that you would speak to us clearly, help us to listen and understand what you're saying to us, and then give us courage to do whatever it is you ask us to do. And once we hear from you, God, give us opportunity to share with some other guys what you're teaching us. And then do that same thing in them. Thank you, God. We love you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Proverbs 14 or 4, starting in verse 14. You guys follow along with me as I read here. Keep off the path of the wicked. Don't proceed on the way of evil ones. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it and pass it by. For they can't sleep unless they've done what is evil. They are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, shining brighter and brighter until midday. But the way of the wicked is like the darkest gloom. They don't know what makes them stumble. So right here, we're just contrasting and comparing two different ways of life. And then we get a little bit more specific, picking it back up in verse 20. My son, pay attention to my words. Listen closely to my sayings. Don't lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly, and don't let your lips talk deviously. Let your eyes look forward. Fix your gaze straight ahead. Carefully consider the path for your feet, and all your ways will be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Keep your feet away from evil. My son, 
Pay attention to my wisdom. Listen closely to my understanding so that you may maintain discretion and your lips safeguard knowledge. We finish it up there in chapter 5, verse 2, just so you know where we were. But before we even dive into this scripture specifically, we need to point out a couple super important things. A couple things when it comes to our path that are very, very important. The first thing is God's powerful authority. God and his word are the ultimate authorities in our lives, or at least they should be. He created us and is in complete control. So we better pay attention to what he says. His character is flawless and his record is perfect. So we know we can trust him. And his power is limitless. So we know that he can and will do everything that he says. He wants us to not only know his truth in our heads, but to live it out through our lives. Listen to what Jesus says about his authority in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He has it because God gave it to him. So we should listen and we should start now. The second thing we need to take into consideration is my personal accountability. We are all accountable to God for what we do with what he's given us. We're all going to have to stand before him one day and answer for what we have and haven't done. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We're all going to be rewarded or lose rewards based on our actions and our motives in this life. We're responsible for ourselves and all that God entrusted us with here while we're here. And as men, that starts but doesn't end with our families. It's serious stuff. We can't play around with this because too much is on the line. Back to Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. God, give us a clean heart. And when we talk about the heart, it's the center of a person that consists of our mind, our will, and our emotions, who we really are at the core. It might be better or more helpful for us to understand this as mind instead of heart. And the battle is for the mind. Jesus said that what you say reveals what's in your heart. Matthew 15, 18. But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And this defiles a person. When he says above all else in Proverbs 4, 23, that means we have to be diligent. We cannot overstress the importance of this. And then the source of life. All of life's issues lead back to heart problems. Whether they're our own heart problems or other people's. We have to guard our heart, guys. We need clean hearts. And the heart must be right if the life is to be right. Right thinking re leads to right living. The heart determines who we are and therefore what we do. Proverbs 23, 7 says this, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Belief leads to behavior, and behavior reveals belief. If you were to follow me or anybody else around for a while and see how I live my life, it would become obvious to you what I really believe. And without me ever having to say a word, you would pretty much be able to get some educated guesses about what makes me live the way I live. And that all goes back to what I believe. But we can't follow our hearts. Why not? Because we are bent and broken by our sin nature, making it impossible for us to do this on our own. We desperately have to rely on God's grace in our lives. And this will be encouraging. You're going to like this 
This is going to be edifying for you guys, so don't miss it. Pay attention here. Listen to a few of the ways that God's Word describes us here, starting in Proverbs 28, 26. The real you is foolish. It says this, the one who trusts in himself is a fool. Good stuff, right? I knew you would like that. We have to think about ourselves maybe at the age between 18 and 21. Or for me, it was probably more like between 13 and 25. Most of you guys probably never knew me then, but I can tell you this. I thought I knew it all, but the only thing I really knew was how to make a mess. I did a great job of that. And if you're 18 to 21 years old right now, maybe you don't understand this, but look back in about 10 years and maybe you'll get it. And if not, there may be even bigger problems, okay? We can talk about that later. But not only is the real you foolish, the real you is also unreliable. Hebrews 3.12 says, Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. We can't trust ourselves to do what's right. And nobody else can really trust us either. As much as we may want to, as much as we want to do the right thing, we are going to let God and ourselves and each other down. It's just a matter of time. The real you is also corrupt. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? We are at our core sinful people by the product of the fall. We're me monsters. It's all about us. That's why marriages and families regularly fail. And they'll continue to until we figure this out. We can't keep asking, what's in it for me? Or what am I going to get out of it? So I hope that you'll all agree with me when I say this, that the worst possible advice you could give or take from anybody is follow your heart. Please don't ever say or do that again. We not only need a clean heart, but we also need a cautious mouth. God, give us a cautious mouth. Proverbs 4.24 says, Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly, and don't let your lips talk deviously. We may think right away, Oh, this is a woman's problem. This isn't a men's issue. But I think we all know better. I would guess that every single one of us has been a part of, of a conversation to some degree that includes lying and deceiving and manipulating, gossiping, or tearing other people down. We can also tempt other people with our speech, talk about immoral things, tell dirty jokes, or spread innuendo. We need to stop it. We need to stay away from those people who do it. We can't even be involved passively when this is going on. We can just remove ourselves from the conversation. And move on. Listen how Jesus describes this in Matthew 15, 18 through 19. I talked about 18 a little bit ago, but he says this, What comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, and slander. In Proverbs 21, 23, the one who guards his mouth and tongue keeps himself out of trouble. I could have saved myself a lot of pain over all these years if I would have learned this a long time ago. Hopefully you can learn it now and save you some. And here's a quote from Justin Martyr on this subject. I thought it was great. By examining the tongue of a patient, physicians find out of the diseases Excuse me, by examining the tongue of a patient, physicians find out the diseases of the body. Philosophers find out the diseases of the mind. And Christians find out the diseases of the soul. Wow, how true and powerful that is. Also, a couple more scriptures I would love for you to take some time to read through and pray through that I'm not going to read to you right now, but 
if you want to, you can even stop, pause the video, read through these right now, and jump back on here. I promise that I'll wait for you. But here they are. You can write them down if you're not going to do them right now. Psalm 143.3, Ecclesiastes 5, 1 through 6, and then Psalm 19.14. Please do, if you're not going to stop right now and check those out, after the video is done, go back and read those. You'll be glad you did. As men, we need a clean heart, a cautious mouth, and we also need a controlled eye. God, give us a controlled eye. Proverbs 4.25 says, Let your eyes look forward. Fix your gaze straight ahead. Who knows that if you're walking, riding, or driving, wherever you're looking is where you're going to end up. If you think about sitting in the car and turning the wheel, automatically you turn. If you're walking down the road and you turn to look at something, you automatically start going in that direction. The same thing is true if you're riding a bike or a motorcycle. Your direction is going to be determined by the way and where you're looking. We need to pay attention to where we are. And we also need to pay attention to where we're going. If our sight isn't clear, it'll cause us to crash and cost us cash. I'll never forget in the beginning the introduction to a book called Every Man's Battle. Excellent book, by the way. If you're a guy watching this and you haven't read that book, you need to pick it up. Every guy needs to read it. But he was talking about this story. He was driving down the road and he just happened to see a scantily clad lady jogging towards him. And he didn't just catch a glance, but he continued to follow her as she jogged past his car. The next thing he knew, he had run into the car in front of him. Can you imagine the conversation that he had to have with his wife that night? Yikes. Talk about painful stuff. That's a small, small story about how our vision can cost us so much and why it's such a big deal that we need to pay attention to where we're looking. If we follow after our focus and our gaze controls our ways, and it's not only for our own sakes, but those who are watching what we watch, how many times have you been somewhere and seen somebody looking up and watching something, and instinctive, instinctively, without even a word, nobody says anything, you begin to look in that same direction. They don't have to be pointing, they don't have to be doing anything, just to see what they're staring at. It's not enough to say, hey, in our house, our kids are going to watch what's on our TVs, and watch what's on our screens, on our phones, on our computers, but wherever we're looking, other people are going to be looking too, simply because we are. We lead in the direction that we look. Our eyes give us away. And whatever captivates you, you are captives too. So let me ask you a question. What captivates your thoughts? We need to focus. We need to get rid of anything that detracts or distracts us from the, cost, from the cross of Christ. Everything other than the gospel has to be ruled out. We have to leave it behind. So what's your vision? What's your mission? What are your goals? What specifically has God called you to? You need to ask and answer those questions. Don't just let this go by. But again, if you need to stop and pause right now and think and pray through these questions and not only answer them in your head, but write them down, do that. And then you can jump back on and we'll keep going together. But when you think about your life, think about your finances, your spiritual life, your career goals, and your relationships. Write down what those goals look like for you. It's important for us to have them and know them. And there's something that solidifies it for us when we write them down so that they become real to us so we can start taking action 
on these things in our life. I'll share a quick one with you that may not have anything to do with your life, but, but it's a big goal for me. This is something I've never done before, and I started some point in time last year. I'm reading through the entire Bible, and I've done that many times before, but this time I'm writing Scripture down word for word as I go through the Bible book by book, and then I'm adding my own commentary. So later on, I'll have notes to go back and reference as I prepare to teach, and hopefully someday I'll be able to pass them on to somebody else that will also be able to benefit from them, hopefully as much as I do. I'm in Deuteronomy now, and so far I've done eight other books. I've got a long way to go. Um, eight and whatever number down and 57 to go, so it's going to take me a long time. But what is it for you? What are the kind of goals that you have for yourself or that God has for you to affect you and your family? Listen to what the, writers, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. What is it that catches you up? What is it that slows you down? What is it that distracts you from running the race that God has laid out before you? Those are the things we need to let go of. Those are the things that we need to cut loose and we need to leave in our past and never look back on those things again. A man of God has a sense of future about himself and those he leads. We need to be committed and in control, using our desired destination as a filter for the choices that we make. One great way to do this is by asking this question before acting on each any decision that we may make. Where will this lead me tomorrow and later in the future? Every choice is going to lead us to another intersection of decisions that will either increase or decrease the likelihood at arriving at our intended destination. Adults know how to put off this gratification. Delayed gratification over instant gratification. Instant gratification is what boys do, is what kids do, and so being a man looks like putting off the things that we may want now because these things in the future are more important to us. Here's a great line from an Atlanta area pastor, Crawford Loritz. He quoted his dad saying this to him when he was a kid. You're going somewhere. Act like it. See, his dad knew that his choices were taking him somewhere. And we have to begin to behave like the person we want to become. So we'll be ready for what's there when we arrive. No matter if it's a problem, a promotion, a person, or even a possession. We become who we are on the way. And we're always preparing for what's next. So let's get ready now because other people are counting on us. Who's on the journey with you, and where are you taking them? Where will they be if they follow me? Then, what are you passing on to a time you cannot see? We're all going to leave something behind. And whatever that is, whatever that looks like, that's going to be our legacy. It's more about the who than the what, because the who is going to be able to continue to make a difference in the world long after we're gone. So what does that look like for you? Who are you intentionally investing your life in? What will your legacy be? Men are called to be a portrait of the desired destination at which others should wish to arrive. So what kind of picture are you painting? I think lots of us, we could look down at that canvas and see nothing but a bunch of splashes and spills because whatever happened along the way happened by accident. It's kind of a Jackson Pollock, Pollock type work, right? Because we haven't been doing anything on purpose. But God wants our portrait to look more like an oil on canvas painting, one where every brush stroke is on purpose and for a purpose. 
the good news is that if it hasn't been that way so far, we can allow God today to start turning that mess into a masterpiece. So who do you know that wants to be where you go? And by the way, that picture, it's not a self-portrait of us. It's more about the way that we impact other people's lives and how different they look because of that. We're pointing them not just to a place, but to a person. And a great deal of temptation comes through the eyes. Job 31.1 says this, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look at a young woman? We have to get lust under control in our lives. I wish I could unsee some of the things that I have seen in my life because they've had a tremendously negative impact on me for years and years. And guys, if you're looking at, if you're watching porn, go get help. Go get help. Tell somebody you're not going to quit on your own. If you were, you would have already done it. You don't have to be controlled by it anymore. But to break free, you have to expose it to the light. So don't wait another day. A clean heart, a cautious mouth, a controlled eye, and God give us a careful foot. Proverbs 4, 26 and 27 says this, Carefully consider the path for your feet, and all your ways will be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left, Keep your feet away from evil. We need to think through where we're headed, where our path is leading us. You'll not change your ways until you change your mind. And men are able to make a choice. But once made, the choice makes the man. To be a man means that you're a steward of direction. You have people following you. We all have influence over somebody. Whether it's your kids, whether it's people at work, in school, I don't know what that looks like for you, but there are people watching every one of us. And wherever you look, you lead. So who are you following? Because a man who isn't following anyone is a man who isn't worth following. Your followers not only see where you are, but where you go and what you promote. Everywhere we go and don't go says something about us, and we can't afford to err. All of our actions have consequences, not only for ourselves, but for other people as well. And before we can lead, we have to learn to follow. And before we can lead other people, we have to learn to lead ourselves well. To get off the proven path or out of the safety of the pack is to make one vulnerable to attack. I want you to think about how that works and how that looks in the animal kingdom. And let me tell you this, guys, there are no shortcuts. We think, oh, I've found a better way. I can do this differently. I can do this more quickly. No, no. I want you to think about those animals that stay together in packs for protection. And as soon as one of them goes off by themselves, they are a target for the enemy. And when they attack, they're basically helpless because they're off the proven path and they're outside of the pack that they could be protected in. We need to remember that. Proverbs 16, 25 says this, There's a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. You're not going to figure out a new way. You're not going to figure out something different that Scripture doesn't already lay out for us that's going to work better for you. We've got to do it the way that it's laid out for us. We can't get thrown off course. It's so easy, but the cost is so high. Take a look at Deuteronomy 1 when you get a chance after the video's over, maybe, where Moses is repeating back to the children of Israel right before they go off into the promised land the consequences of the sin, all of those 40 years of wandering in the desert and all of the death it brought because they didn't go and do what God told them. And then he laid out for them the blessings and the cursings that were going to be before them once they did inherit the land. 
it's so imperative that we stick to Scripture and do it God's way. God's way is going to get us where we want to go. Listen to these two quotes by Henry Blackaby. Spiritual immaturity is slow to heed God's voice unless hardships come. Delayed obedience is disobedience. I want to avoid the hardships. I've learned all too well too many times I've earned those hardships due to being slow to respond to God. And I'm sure you can say the same things. I don't recommend it, but they are thorough teachers. And the second quote is this, Spiritual deadness is revealed when no word of God can move us to action. Because dead things can't move. Dead things can't hear. And this makes me think of the parable of the soils. What's the condition of your heart. Hard hearts lead to hardships, but soft soil can produce a bumper crop. Keep this in mind though. Rich, fertile soil doesn't just happen on its own. It needs its fair share of rain. And sometimes we think, why? Why all this rain in my life? But that's what keeps the soil moist. It needs to be weeded constantly If we let it go on its own, the weeds will grow up and choke out any of the fruit that we would be able to produce in our lives. And so that picking and plucking may be uncomfortable, but it's necessary. And then it gets doo-doo dumped on it. Yeah, that's right. I said it. Sometimes life stinks, right? And we wonder why we're having to go through these situations and circumstances in life. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's through those hard times that we are able to then be able to produce fruit later on. And then it has to be plowed up. It has to be loosened. The deep, dark stuff down inside us needs to be exposed to the light. And we need to break up some of those clods of hard soil in our hearts. It's got to be worked regularly. So don't be surprised when life isn't easy. It's a painful process, but it ends up being productive. James 1.8 says this, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We must decide. We must commit. We can't waver. We can't wonder. We have to be steadfast and immovable. The battle is for the mind. It's the flesh versus the Spirit. It's the world versus the Word. And whatever you feed most, that's what's going to win. Finally, God, give us a consecrated ear. Proverbs 5, 1 through 2 says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen closely to my understanding so that you may maintain discretion and your lips safeguard knowledge. Who or what do you listen to? Who are the voices that you allow to speak into your life? We need to be active listeners, not just hearing, but we need to let it prepare our hearts and move us to action. Active listening is revealed through obedient action. There are probably some voices we need to let go of and leave behind in our lives in order to hear more clearly from God through prayer and through the time that we spend with Him in His Word. We need to allow him to speak to us. But because we're so busy and we leave no margin in our lives, it feels so many times like he's silent. But it's not true. He's always talking to us. The question is, are we listening? Are we getting quiet? Even turning off our own voices and our thoughts and our opinions so that we can hear from him. Sin also keeps us from hearing from God. You ever tried to listen to your wife or your mom or your girlfriend with your earbuds in or you watching the game on TV and they're talking in the background and you never heard a word they said? It's the same exact way with God. We must make time with him a priority and we have to allow other mature men the freedom to speak into our lives as well. And so the last question I have for you before we wrap this up is this. Who or what do you need to turn off 
so that you can hear from God more clearly. Don't be going and telling your wife or your mom or your girlfriend that I said they're not, you're not allowed to listen to them anymore. I'm asking you the question. You have to answer it for yourself. Who or what do you need to turn off so you can hear more clearly from God? And so just to wrap it up, a quick recap. We need to be careful about how we think, about what we say, about what we see, where we go, and also what we hear. I hope this time has been beneficial for you guys as we think about our paths in life. Thanks so much for taking the time to spend with me today to listen. If there's anything that I can do to help you, please let me know. And next Wednesday, join us again for the third part of our study. Have a great week. Thank you.